calling in from Washington, D.C. Um, first of all, I hope all of you and your communities and your families are taking good care and staying safe and healthy these days. Um, we really appreciate you all joining this call. We're here to talk about Food Hub direct-to-consumer innovations, and this call is brought to you by the Food Systems Leadership Network. The Food Systems Leadership Network is a national peer learning community that connects current and emerging leaders, strengthens individual and collective leadership capacity, and fosters collaboration across communities to accelerate the realization of a just, equitable, and sustainable food system that generates good food, health, and opportunity for all. Um, I think you're all probably very familiar with Zoom calls at this point, but just a reminder to please keep yourself muted until the question and answer section, which is going to take place after we hear our presentations. If you do have a question that arises during the presentations, you can put it in the chat box and we'll come back around to it um, at the end of the call for the Q&A section. So we're here today to learn about how three hubs pivoted in response to the COVID pandemic. As we all remember, in March, most food businesses were required to totally rethink how they reached their customers and who their customers even were. A lot of hubs that were previously heavily invested in institutional and restaurant supply chains were forced to figure out how to engage with customers without a college or a cafe in the middle. Box programs emerged as a way for these hubs to continue to move the product that their farmers had while also meeting consumers where they were. Though the concept of a CSA box is nothing new, and lots of nonprofits and hubs were running box programs long before we all learned what PPE stood for, this became a critical lifeline for lots of hubs and food businesses, some of whom had never run a direct-to-consumer program before. Today we'll hear about three ways that hubs met the needs in their communities through box programs, both subsidized and full price, and some of the operations changes and relationship management that went into these programs. One thing that struck me as I was hearing the stories of these three hubs was how important collaboration and relationship building was, regardless of the type of box program they were running. So keep an eye out for instances where these folks had to lean on either existing relationships or create new ones on the fly as you're listening to their stories today. First up, I'm going to introduce Katie Nixon and Alicia Ellingsworth from the Kansas City Food Hub. Katie and Alicia relied on neighborhood leaders to create a new customer base when COVID struck in March. I'm going to introduce them with their bios and then they'll take away. Um, so Alicia is the sales and production director for the farmer owned and farmer run cooperative, the Kansas City Food Hub. She works with its 20 small and medium sized farms aggregating produce, protein and value added goods to meet the demands of Kansas City's institutions and in response to COVID-19 developed the neighborhood farm share program, which we'll hear about today. She's the co-founder and executive director of the nonprofit Kansas City Farm School at Gibbs Road that brings individuals of all ages and abilities on farm hands-on. Her BA in sociology and Middle Eastern studies are from the Ohio State University, and she's a fellow with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Her farming roots go back to the melon fields of Southern Indiana, which sounds very nice. Uh, Katie Nixon is a farmer and local food systems champion who's been working with and for producers for over 10 years in the Kansas City region. Along with her husband, Katie cooperates the Green Gate Family Farm, a certified organic diversified market farm where they produce vegetables, fruits, bedding plants, eggs, and flowers. Katie is a founding member and current president of the Kansas City Food Hub. Katie also serves as the food systems director for the West Central Missouri Community Action Agency. She's participated in sustainable food and farming work in Washington, Ireland, South Africa, Mexico, and New Zealand. All right, so I'm gonna hand it off to Katie and Alicia to tell us about their box program. Thanks for that. It's always weird hearing your bio read out loud. It's sort of silly, but <laughs> you're very <laughs> impressive. Uh, yes, I'm very impressive. <laughs> um, in the end, really what I love is to have my hands dirty and um, my uh, head sweaty, So, which is what it kind of is right now. I was out and about this morning, so um, now I'm really happy to be here and see everybody on the call um, and know that there are so many wonderful, amazing people working on um, feeding each other in this crazy time and even before this crazy time we were um, all scrambling and I for one can speak to how much we scrambled this year and it just was exhausting so um, <laughs> there is uh, while we have a, a great story to tell right now there's a lot of messiness with um, everything that goes on uh, just you know, from having to change a whole new system. So I'm going to give you just an intro to the Food Hub, and then Alicia is going to take it away because um, she was the one with boots on the ground um, and the blood, sweat, and tears of uh, running our uh, new neighborhood farm share program. So um, our Food Hub, uh, as Ellie mentioned in um, um, 
Alicia's bio is a cooperative. We are um, a, a cooperative association incorporated as such, and all of our members are owners of the business. And we run, um, our structure is a board of directors that run um, and oversee the operation. And then we have staff that do all of the work. Um, so we uh, have 20 members, but it, it's about 25 farms that are represented. Um, and we're very proud to be farmer owned and farmer run. Our farmers are price makers, not price takers. Um, and we are always out there looking for new markets for them and helping buyers get connected with our farmers. We think we're stronger together and that is our mission is to sell medium, small to medium sized farmers products. Um, and we have mostly been focused on produce and um, eggs with uh, a little bit of protein um, in there, but our predominant sales are uh, produce. So um, we are in year five of, um, of an operation and we started off pretty small uh, with five growers and a great feasibility study that was put together by a whole bunch of partners. Um, and in our first year, we maybe did $20,000 in sales, but we were able to hire a director because we had a value added producer grant. Um, and we've grown uh, in our fourth year, we did about $90,000 in sales and we're on track to do well over 100 this year. So we're happy with our slow and steady growth and our slow and steady growth of the organization to make it last into the future. <laughs> um, and so we do depend on some outside grant funding for um, building that operation infrastructure. We're very proud of the fact that we only take 20% margin on every box um, of produce and only a 10% margin on protein. Um, with the neighborhood farm share, we have a different structure because the overhead is a lot higher. Um, it's uh, 40, 60 in terms of what the food hub kind of charges. And I won't get into the weeds of that right now. If there's questions about our um, how we set up that percentage and stuff, we can talk about that. But um, so basically the, the growers still get the wholesale price. Um, it's not that they're getting 60% and we're getting 40. We actually charge a retail price to the consumer and the farmer still gets the same price that they would have gotten if they had sold it into the wholesale market. Um, before COVID, uh, everything starts off with before COVID, right? Before you explain where you're at today. Um, before COVID, we had 100% wholesale market. Um, corporate cafeterias were one of our best customers. Um, schools were pretty good and we were building that market and also larger restaurants. Um, we don't want to compete with our smaller growers and they have, there's a great uh, farm to restaurant relationships here in Kansas City. So we're going after the larger restaurants that don't really want to work with 20 growers to get, you know, one item or something like that. So that's where we're focused. And obviously um, that completely changed um, with COVID and uh, the restaurants closing and the corporate cafeterias closing. And so we had to decide well, what are we going to do now? We have all these growers that are ramping up for the season, um, and now all these consumers are knocking on the door and asking for stuff. So I am going to turn it over to Alicia. Awesome. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, probably, uh, like most of you, I spent um, the whole week in the middle of March sitting and thinking and um, trying to figure out what was next exactly what Katie said and like you all probably we were scaling up for the year and um, knocking on doors we hadn't talked to for a while and um, those doors just weren't answered and just one by one we would check in with with our buyers and they just weren't there and um, more than they weren't just there right they were also suffering so um, we do what farmers or we did what farmers do is like turn around and see how we can pull it all together and where we can pick up the pieces and um, many of us um, run our own csa so that seemed like the obvious first choice so we just started at at square one um, mostly with social media um, posting on facebook a little bit on instagram um, anyone out there interested in veggie boxes um, and, you know, if you think back to that, those times, people were frantic for food. So it was in a lot of ways an easy sell. Um, it's a little bit different now keeping those, um, those members on when there seems to be no problem. Our uh, food is back on the shelves. But back then people were clamoring for uh, local food because they felt that um, they could trust it. And so our customers were people that we hadn't talked to before. Um, they weren't 
farmers market customers and they weren't people who were in CSA. That was a brand new market that we were looking at. Um, I exactly I pulled together some relationships we had. So I know a marketing genius and uh, she and her partner started uh, reaching out to the people they knew through the through the channels that they knew and they put together some templates and that we could just copy and send out to others and it was so much word of mouth. It was just so much people stepping up. Um, I think um, for years we'll be talking about how much people stepped up over the past few months and um, people I think who didn't realize they were neighborhood activists um, said I can do that. I can pull together 10 neighbors. I can um, have delivery on my patio or on my front porch. So um, the neighborhood farm share program was born and um, we've seen companies go out of business um, trying to deliver to doors um, and not making that uh, work logistically. So we knew we couldn't do that. I knew Katie wouldn't let me do that. So, um, so we came up with uh, if we have, if you can, if you can, if a person can pull together 10 neighbors and have one drop site, uh, we would deliver 10 boxes to that neighborhood. Um, we had COVID guidelines that the coordinators would then share with the members um, and people were and still are doing it all different ways. Some people set up their table out by the driveway. Some people have a pickup on their front porch, some around the corner behind their house in their garage. So people, that's what I'm seeing is especially then and still people doing what they needed to do in order to get their neighbors food. Um, the height of the season, so it was probably June, we had 15 neighborhoods doing this. And um, I believe that the highest number we reached was 210 members um, and folks would get a delivery once a week. Uh, we're pulling from a really wide area too. So with Kansas City sitting right in the center of um, the food hub radius, we would drive out to about 125 miles, the furthest that we would pick up product. and. Um, at the height of the season, we also were doing that a couple times a week. Um, in addition to the neighborhood farm share box, we are also, we dallied with um, another home delivery service um, that worked with limited success. So that was another, um, there, there was a middle person there, but it was home delivery. And then we also um, saw a big increase in our own farms, farm stands. So we are made up of 20 individual farms, a few are rural, a few are, are urban and most are rural and six of us have our own farm stands. And those like our farmers look completely different. Some are um, big fancy, some are side of the road, um, but they saw a big increase. We all have seen a big increase in those sales. Um, so for example, one of the farm stores typically would do $750 a week um, in sales direct to their neighbors. And at the height of the season, they were doing like $10,000 a week. I'm curious about the logistics for, should I be answering these questions? So um, we use local food marketplace and that's a great way for people to sign on as um, members. Uh, we designated these 15 neighborhood sites and um, people would sign on, register, pay for the whole 10 week session upfront. So we would charge um, 250 plus tax. They would pay that and then we wouldn't have to deal with money any longer. We also had the option of a um, add on boxes so people get eggs, cheese, um, bread, ferments, um, extra veggies or keto. We didn't really figure out the meat um, add on, but that was an option for a while. And then we, um, we did these neighborhood info sheet printouts that we boxed from and then went um, along to the neighborhood farm share coordinator to check um, their members in and off and check the boxes out. So we are wrapping up our um, about 15 weeks. What is that? We're probably in week 23. I didn't, I didn't stop to think about what week we're in. We're gonna continue to do boxes until the first week of December and then take a breath. We brought on- I would also say, I would also say our market shifted over to the pantries as well. We worked hand in hand with several food pantries and we worked with the Housing Foundation to provide a ton of food to low and secure people across the region. And that has been 
huge. I mean, that replaced a big volume of our wholesale. And so they were able to access COVID money to pay for that food to get into their pantries. So it's kind of, it's probably a one-off. I can't imagine them getting that much money next year or in the future, but um, it was a great way to move a whole bunch of produce. Can I ask y'all another question too, in terms of like the revenue that y'all are used to seeing, what did this year look like compared to last year or the year before? Yeah, our sales are up um, from the past two years. It's, we're gonna have to wait and see and do some math. Um, our, our expenses are also up, right? Because yeah. we've had a lot more uh, staffing to, to make the boxes. Mm -hmm. Katie, have you done those numbers? Uh, not, not pain. Uh, I haven't gotten to the painful point of like exact number, but um, uh, I, I know our sales um, for the time frame that we're talking about were definitely up like 200%, but our cost was up like 200%. So it was just a different, it was a totally different rhythm. Um, yeah. And did y'all hire a bunch of folks as well? Or did you take part-time people to full-time? How did the labor side work? Yeah, labor was challenging with COVID and people um, having brushes with and potentially getting COVID um, and having to stay home. And um, so there were some issues there. Um, and also with that sort of turnover um, in a position, you know, that's sort of a lot of stress. And, you know, that was part of the issue was logistics of a 14 hour day. Um, not going to keep an employee very long at that rate and thankfully Alicia didn't strangle me and leave but <laughs> there was some August was hard August was really hard do you have any wise words if someone were to use this sort of neighborhood <laughs> pod model to give people advice of ways you messed up or things you learned I'm gonna let Alicia answer that question <laughs> We learned a lot, but I, at the same time, there's, I'm still not completely sure why it was as frantic as it was, you know, um, sure we had more driving and sure we had more coordinating, but um, that's some, something I'm going to be thinking about over the next few months. Uh, I, I don't, I think it's, it's running a CSA um, too extreme. So um, I don't know that there's a lot of extra things. Um, what we'll do going forward, though, will be set up our shop and then keep it set up. We actually moved shops in July. So we had to start all over. Um, we're also doing all this work at a remote site, one of our sub hubs. So we're driving out an hour and an hour back. Uh, so just getting our shops set up first making sure we have those systems in place and the, and the equipment and supplies that we need. Yeah. Also find great people who can help and support you. And, you know, like uh, our marketing team, they were just working, what, like five hours a week. They would spend an hour answering emails and sending out, you know, to the community. And so that sort of strategic, um, employee there for a moment was really key to getting a lot of neighborhood farm shares on and once they stopped working for us we saw a distinct dip in um, interest so got to keep that marketing up right wonderful any last little notes and then um <laughs> we'll switch well i think in the end our farmers are happy and so that's really what matters um, because we're here for our cooperative farmers. And so um, that's a success. <laughs> well, thank you both for telling your story. I love the idea of sort of using some of that neighborhood infrastructure of folks that, you know, already know each other so that you're not making all those individual drops. I think that was really brilliant um, and a really smart use of just some existing infrastructure. Um, so thanks. And we'll be coming back around to Katie and Alicia with questions at the end. So keep them coming. Um, and Katie and Alicia, if you see specific ones that you want to answer in the chat, feel free to do that as well. Um, okay. And next up, we're going to hand the microphone to Nade Park, who's going to tell us about their community's response to the pandemic. And I'm going to introduce Nade. And I think they're having a little bit of bandwidth stuff, so we may not get video, but we are going to see this lovely presentation. 
Um, so Nare Park coordinates community health workshops, food distribution efforts, and other programming in the Koreatown area of LA as part of the Healthy Eating, Active Living, Heal team at the API Forward Movement. They provide English, Korean, and Korean English translation and interpretation support at API FM workshops and in partnership with various community groups. Currently, Nare works closely with the Food Roots team on the COVID-19 emergency CSA, bringing needed fresh produce and eggs to community members across the greater LA area. Prior to working at API FM, Nare was a program associate at the Healthy Neighborhood Market Network of the Los Angeles Food Policy Council. And I'm going on mute. Thanks, Ellie. Sure. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Yeah, you sound great. Okay. That's really great. <laughs> um, thank you so much for the opportunity to hear from you all and also to share our work. Um, speaking to you from Keech land here uh, in so-called Koreatown in Los Angeles, California. And again, my name is Nade. I'm a facilitator with the HEAL team at Asian Pacific Islander Forward Movement. I'm going to share a little bit of background about our organization and then share about how the CSA came about. So for some background um, about API Forward Movement and then about the two teams, HEAL and Food Roots, that kind of work together on this emergency CSA. Uh, API Forward Movement is a nonprofit organization. It's a hybrid service and advocacy org. Um, we're housed under the umbrella of a larger organization called Special Service for Groups, which is mostly made up of direct service agencies. Our mission is to create a world where all communities of color have full power to access good health and a healthy environment. Um, and right now we're in the past couple of years in the process of building relationship across the many different Asian American and Pacific Islander communities in our sprawling region. Um, this photo is of some wonderful folks from our Chinatown workshops. Um, the Healthy Eating Active Living program under API FM is focused on that relationship building. So we're doing uh, nutrition education, facilitated discussions, cooking demonstrations, food distribution, gardening, and culturally and age appropriate physical activity like Tai Chi Qi Gong and then stretching exercises like this. And then the Food Roots program is our program to connect uh, small farmers of color who are growing Asian specialty crops um, in a way that you know, practices reverence for the land, um, connecting those farmers to communities and businesses in the greater LA area. Uh, so the farmers that we work with, we have a network of folks, but these three folks in particular, David, Ken, and June, um, were uh, the providers for the emergency CSA, and they're fairly close to our area. So the emergency CSA um, delivers this produce from the farmers to community members across the city and county. Uh, this is a program that came out of a response to many of our partners in Little Tokyo, Koreatown, Historic Filipino Town, Chinatown and the San Gabriel Valley, as well as South Bay, saying that there's a critical need for uh, culturally appropriate, fresh, organic produce for uh, multiple so-called at-risk populations that we're connected to, from seniors to immune-compromised folks, immigrant low-wage workers, um, and within that, mostly Asian and Pacific Islander folks with some black and brown folks as well. And because Food Roots had this pre-existing network of relationships with local farmers um, in around mid-March in response to that need, um, we started this program. We're distributing to folks we know from our workshops that we have direct relationships with, but we're also fielding requests from partner organizations, from grassroots groups, and also connecting some of those groups to folks who are redistributing surplus um, gleaned produce from grocery stores and from farmers markets uh, when we are not able to meet uh, the requests that they have. So right now on a weekly basis, we're distributing 200 to 500 emergency CSA bags a week. Um, across LA City, San Gabriel Valley, and the South Bay. Um, and if you don't know the LA area, that's a really broad region. 
Um, and this is what the bags look like. So mostly vegetables, culturally appropriate vegetables, some fruits, and then a carton of eggs. Um, these bags are really important um, because a lot of the individuals and families that we work with um, are receiving non-perishables, shelf-stable um, food goods from bank food banks and pantries and not a lot of fresh produce. And then besides the produce, the bags also include information about COVID-19 in language, um, physical activity, infographics, recipes, nutrition fact sheets, and then occasionally, depending on the uh, need and requests, like information about the census and other resources that are available locally for folks who need them. Uh, so uh, again, the goal is to uh, you know, be in relationship with uh, individual community members, but also to ensure that the Asian American small farmers and farmers of color we work with are also able to support their families uh, and their workers. So this is our team uh, doing the general activities, packing the bags, distributing to sites. Um, we redirected a good amount of our organizational capacity to this emergency response effort. We've got some seasonal intern support um, here. So this is a really like small picture of what we are seeing happen every week um, right now. And um, this is an example of a recipient site. So the Tongan Interfaith Council uh, receives produce from us once a month and then distributes to different Tongan ch churches in South Bay. So they're doing uh, a lot of the like leadership and coordination work and we're really just delivering to them. Um, and the source for this site is actually not our CSA bags, it's Food Forward, which is an organization that does um, collect surplus produce um, and redistribute it uh, to distribution activities and groups. Uh, this is another example, Hillcrest Elementary School uh, in Monterey Park, which receives uh, CSA bags for 20 families in Monterey, uh, in, uh, across the students, families, and teachers connected to the school. First Baptist Church uh, already has a really massive food distribution operation that's really uh, been going on for a while, um, their food distribution has tripled uh, in size over the years. So we're really more of a supplement to what they're doing. And we're delivering 30 CSA bags to them uh, each week. And sometimes we'll drop off pallets to them from Food Forward as well. And um, we're also doing some direct home deliveries for especially our elders in Chinatown and Koreatown and historic Filipino town, uh, folks who who for various reasons aren't able to get out to a distribution site. Um, and we uh, learned that this was really necessary for some of uh, a good majority of the folks we knew who weren't living in assisted housing situations because of lack of access to private transportation, because of disability, because of age and other um, risk factors. So. Um, we ended up incorporating home deliveries um, pretty early on. Okay, so just to summarize with some ongoing questions, um, here are our numbers since March 16. Um, we, I did mention that we uh, shifted a significant amount of our organizational capacity to emergency response, but there's still more need. There's, this doesn't, the, these numbers don't even really capture the distribution that we're involved in outside of the CSA bags um, that our partners are, uh, are working on. And we are also continuing to get asks on a pretty regular basis uh, for partnership, for connection to uh, produce providers, so clearly there is an outpacing of need, even though we're really working at like way beyond what our current capacity is. Um, but we definitely aren't doing this alone. This is a list of the um, local groups and organizations that we're uh, working with. Hawaii's Daughter Guild of California, for example, this is a new relationship that we were able to build through this emergency CSA, um, uh, providing the group with CSA bags, canned shelf-stable goods, and cleaning supplies. Um, and 
of course, that's only possible because they already have really good relationships um, that they're um, uh, building on. And then another example is Southeast Asian Community Alliance and Chinatown Community for Equitable Development, SICA and CCED. They actually have been organizing against displacement in Chinatown and have their own PPE and grocery distribution operations. So we're really just the produce and eggs provider. And occasionally we overlap in terms of who we're serving because we're serving some seniors who also live in that area. And then we're also working with schools, faith institutions, and small businesses. So we're really um, seeing the action that we're taking to address this crisis in ways echoing um, what's happening on the ground level in all the communities we're connected to, you know, led by community residents themselves and also groups of folks who have already been building relationships. So the MOL Church, uh, for example, um, has, of course, deep relationships of reciprocity and trust and also people live just down the street from the church. So receiving bags from us and sorting and distribution really makes sense for them as an activity to build on. Um, the existing uh, relationships that they have. And then we're also seeing some small businesses um, incorporating community market activities um, using the produce that they're receiving from us. Um, some challenges that we went through that might feel familiar to some of you. Uh, one of our teammates tested positive a little while ago um, and that really forced us to take a pause and revisit our safety protocols. We which were already really rigorous, but um, uh, introducing new things like scheduling regular breaks for the team uh, and uh, creating backup plans for folks uh, in the instance that they have to quarantine because of exposure and doing monthly check-ins as well on um, testing status if folks are comfortable sharing and also just being aware of each other's health condition um, and being mutually supportive in that way. And then, of course, the ongoing challenge of funds and staffing. Um, we have a really awesome collaborative team that has been focused on fundraising um, for the past couple of months and also um, applying for emergency response grants, uh, which we've been fairly successful in um, getting together. Um, in addition to that, we are also in partnership with some orgs that have access to funding they can use to purchase the produce. But for the most part, we're really sustaining this work um, because the produce bags we want to be subsidized or free for most of the recipients that we're working with. So the need is going to persist and if it escalates in coming months, I think this is gonna to continue to be the priority question. Um, one of the farmers that we work with, um, David, uh, reported that the emergency CS or CSA orders were really important because of a drop in restaurant sales in the past couple of months. So obviously that's not gonna accommodate for everything and we want to see more stability and support for our farmers as well. But um, it was good to know that it was a supportive relationship. Um, and then uh, another thing that we found was really useful was um, the infrastructure that we already had in place of making sure to be in uh, contact with folks that we're um, hosting workshops with and just are in community with. Um, our regular check-in calls ended up being a really good way of assessing what folks might need that we would be able to provide, um, including PPE, cleaning supplies, um, and other resource shares like the information that was coming out locally about um, rent relief and um, uh, income support. Uh, as well as um, more general uh, needs like the census. Um, and in terms of planning for the future, um, we've had uh, we've had a lot going on here. We've had fires, you know, we had little earthquakes. Um, this last couple of months have been really wild. Um, and then in addition to that, we're seeing ongoing uprisings for racial justice and lots of really beautiful mutual aid efforts, seeing an influx of support from new people. So obviously nonprofit efforts are an important 
important piece. And we understand also that all of our efforts within that system are temporary and they come with conditions. So the community building piece is really key to us. And it's important for us to be aware of autonomous grassroots efforts led by most impacted folks who are committed to liberatory healing justice framework. And how do we fit into that or at least work to minimize any potential harm um, so there's a lot that we're still kind of working through and discussing internally and discussing with our community members. So that's really a work in progress, of course. Um, I guess the last thing I would share is that our activities, I guess you could qualify them as kind of food hubbery, but it, it's not our traditional food hub. And, you know, that model really has not been shown to be effective in Los Angeles, be maybe because of the fact that it's such a broad region. There's a lot of different, I mean, that's a whole separate discussion, I think. But um, just to qualify that the work that we're doing is, is really an expansion of the CSA work, um, the food routes, like distribution work that we're doing, rather than like a traditional food hub. Um, if you want to learn a little bit more about our partners or the numbers of how the distribution breaks down, you can go to aifm.org forward slash feed the fam. There's a little bit more numbers there and please do stay in touch with us. Um, we want to learn from you too um, and continue to work together. Um, and this is the contact information for the program manager for Food Roots, Kyle Sukahira. Um, you can contact him directly if you have specific questions about numbers as well. Um, that's it for me. Thank you so much, Nade. I uh, appreciate your use of the term food hubbery because that's, you know, sometimes these boundaries between food hubs and nonprofits that are distributing are sort of soft. And it was cool to see how you all kind of shifted into that mode in response to the need from your community. So you're in good company in that like gray area between food hub and nonprofit. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, great. Well, thank you. So we are going to move on to Christine Kwan. Nara, you're still sharing your, oh, there you go. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I'm going to introduce Christine and then hand the mic over. Um, so we're moving back towards Detroit. Uh, Christine's primary role is to expand economic democracy for food and farm businesses connecting growers with new markets while using every imaginative logistical option available and fostering opportunity, production space, and mentorship to food businesses. Her work gets her connected with farm to school, farm to table, farm to hospital, and farm to institution programs all over the Detroit metro area. In 2019, she assumed management of Eastern Markets Detroit Kitchen Connect, DKC. She also represents Eastern Market for statewide initiatives such as Michigan Good Food Charter, the Michigan Food Hub Network, Michigan Farm to Institution Network, and is the board president for Michigan Family Food Systems, MIFS. Lastly, Christine is Eastern Market's leading authority on food safety and works to continually elevate the safety and integrity of the market. So Christine is going to talk about their COVID pivot in, at Eastern Market in Detroit. Hey, everyone. Um, it is... Uh really an honor to just be in the presence of all of you. I, I really missed seeing all of your faces at the New Orleans get together and I missed going. Uh, all that said, uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Eastern Market, um, Eastern Market is the, I, 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 no one's proved us otherwise, so I'm just gonna say it is the largest um, and oldest public market in the country. Um, we have five buildings that we call sheds that um, we sell underneath. Um, that campus of sheds is uh, about um, seven acres, uh, about five acres of sellable space, um, just to give you an idea of our size. Um, our predominant market is our Saturday market. Uh, it's a retail market and um, before COVID, we would see crowds of anywhere between 30 and 50,000 uh, people on, on a Saturday. Um, Eastern Market, uh, because of our connection in place in Southeast Michigan, um, has leveraged this vulnerable institution to, um, to do food access programs and uh, our um, commercial kitchen program, as I said, and we also have our food hub program that we call Grow Eastern Market. 
Um, we started Grow Easter Market in 2016 um, on a modest grant. Um, we were we were working with predominantly small farms because um, our wholesale, our bigger farms that were already selling in our wholesale market, um, they didn't really quite need our connections, but uh, smaller farms were really looking for new markets and new opportunities. And, um, and then we had restaurants in the city of Detroit that were struggling to find uh, Michigan produce as well. So we got into the game of, of being a cross dock uh, brokerage. So how our program works is that we have about 35 to 40 uh, small farms that we work with. We reach out to them every single week. We find out what they're harvesting. We create a, a produce list. Um, we send that to our community of buyers, which includes restaurants, um, uh, some gro uh, grocery retailers, some institutions, some processors. Uh, they buy from us. We buy from the farms. We pick up at farm gate, which is really critical. And then we deliver within the city of Detroit. Um, that was our, the basis of our model pre-COVID. Um, and just to give you an idea of um, sales uh, before COVID, um, I had done forecasting for us for 2020 and um, with modest growth, um, I saw us at around 80, you know, coming in at about an annual sales of about 82,000. Um, uh, what happened was uh, come mid-March and the, as you know, the bottom dropped out in lots of our lives. And uh, my boss, Dan Carmody, um, came to me and said, listen, we, we need to put the market online. Um, people are going to be really afraid to come to Eastern Market on Saturdays and um, we got to provide a curbside option for them. You have 11 days. Go. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, we had wanted to do a, a consumer produce box. Um, we had thought originally that this consumer produce box would be more of a part of our food access program, our farm stand program. But we decided, well, this is what we're going to do. So we created a produce box um, using our Grow Eastern Market farmers. Um, and we, we did a pilot that first week uh, using a platform called JotForm. And we used JotForm because that's what we were using for Grow Eastern Market towards our restaurants. Um, so we set a goal of 50 boxes. Let's just see how it's going to work out. And um, the first week, and we hit it with our social media, first week we sold out in an hour. Um, so the second week, um, we set our goal at um, uh, 150 boxes. We sold out in about an hour and a half. And at, at 150 boxes, JotForm completely failed for us because it doesn't capture inventories. And so we had to physically monitor when we hit that level and then turn it off. And it wasn't a solution. So in our third week, we pivoted and um, changed the pl platform using Shopify, um, which then could incorporate uh, inventories. And then we also brought in with Shopify, we could bring in all of our value added producers that could typically sell on a Saturday at Eastern Market as well. So we started off with a handful of, of, of our value adds, um, saw a great response, and now, you know, we've, we're up to like three pages on our Shopify site. Um, so probably in our peak, we were doing about 300 boxes, produce boxes a week um at our curbside and how this works too is that uh so we we update this the store on uh mondays we we launch we open it on mondays at noon um folks have until wednesday at noon to get their orders in then we notify we close down the store wednesday afternoon um we send out uh purchase orders to all our value-added folks 
Um, they're bringing that to us uh, Friday evening, Saturday morning before uh, curbside starts. We are um, also assembling um, our boxes, the produce box ourselves on Friday afternoons. We store those in our cooler. Um, and then the show begins on Saturday. And what happens is, is that we, people drive up to one of our sheds, Shed 5. They, we have a route for them in the parking lot to come in. They pull their cars up, they give us their name, we pull their order and we assemble their order. We put it in the back of their car and away they go. We can do this at about three minutes per car, um, which we're pretty excited about. Um, and, uh, and the response has been unbelievable. Um, we just recently sent out a survey uh, to all of our, um, the folks that have been buying from us and just, we're, we're trying to get some feedback on you know, how the program's working for them and if they want anything special for Thanksgiving. And then we said, you know, anything that you wanna tell us about the program, please, please share with us. And you know, I've been with Eastern Market for close to 10 years and there, there's a subset of folks that just were completely overwhelmed at coming to Eastern Market. You know, it's, it's the city and it's parking and it's, you know, a mass of people. And, uh, and this, this was approachable for folks. And, and the feedback that we're getting is how people are excited to come down every week and how they, you know, they're experimenting with new vegetables and um, they love to be, you know, in this time of crisis, feel good about supporting local farmers. The fact that we asked them how, um, if, you know, if they, if it was important for them to buy from Michigan farmers, how many of them? And our, our results were like 72% said that that was one of the leading reasons why they were buying from our program was that they wanted to support um, Michigan farms. So it has been an interesting, um, and it just, and it, it just came together. And, you know, as far as like, resources and staffing you know fortunately we we carved out space in one of our sheds and and it's not perfect because we don't have enough cold storage and we're constantly managing that and making sure we're keeping up with food safety on on curbside days so we have like coolers and plug-in freezers for some folks because we're selling pierogies and we've got frozen, you know, meat that we're selling and that's all got to be frozen. And so it's a ton of logistics that all come together. Um, so, but I can, if anybody's in, I can share my screen right now to give you um, the dashboard on Shopify. I can show you a real live picture of where we're at and it'll show you sales and everything. So can I share my screen, Ellie? Yeah, go ahead. I don't know if I need to like bequeath that to you. You want to try and we'll see if it works. Oh yeah, you're good. Okay, so this is a this is this is the area in which we are operating up. This is obviously not a busy Saturday, but this is an idea of what our box looks like. Um, and what we were like one of one week of our box. Um, and then This is the entryway into our buff program. I'm trying to see my, no, 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 sorry. Every time I try to get at it, it goes down. Hold on. I'm trying to get at it. No, nope, that's not it. <laughs> sorry. No, it's okay. Uh, well, if you want to take see. a screenshot and send it to me, Christine, I can send it out to the attendees. Oh, wait, there we go. Oh, there you go. Oh, Just cool. needed to move this. So, so here's our, this is our sales for the week. Um, up 8% from last week. We can tell that, and, and I, this, the 96.2% is our returning customer rate. So this is obviously working for a segment of folks that keep coming week after week. Um, 
You can see our average order value is about 54 bucks. Um, and the number one item that we're selling is the farm box. We're at 72 boxes right now. Um, we will hold you, you people, even though we close the store on Wednesdays, we, we close it for all the value add, but we'll hold it open for the, for the boxes. So anybody can get boxes and uh, get a produce box and eggs like right up until Friday evening. Cause we'll always make a little bit, we order a little bit more eggs and a little bit more of the farm box. Um, or we make more of the farm box because people order at the last minute. Probably we'll get, we will sell probably 20 farm boxes Friday afternoon um, of, of things that we're doing. So um, this, is, this is our site. You can, it's a great analytical tool of how many people are coming in off of, right off the website or being directed from our social media um, and how that works. So, and then I will share maybe if I can. I have um, our box, our team. So this is some of the value added items that we we are offering. Um, and uh, yeah, and I have one little video that if I can find it. Um, was fun. So, if anybody wants to see our place, <laughs> I'm going kind of fast. Here's our, here's another one of our boxes. Um, but I had a fun video of what it's like to deliver um, a day at Eastern Market. We have an aggressive social media team. <laughs> well, we can have folks check out the Instagram afterwards, but we do want to have some time for questions. Yeah. Um, so if you folks want to have questions or want to ask questions, you can put them for all three presenters. You can put them in the chat box or some that we've gotten already, or you can feel free to unmute um, and ask them yourselves. But I'll get started with some that came from the chat box. Uh, there were a couple sort of technical questions about um, the Kansas City model, but there's one that I wanted to ask all of our presenters today, which is this, these box programs, these responses sort of sprang up out of necessity. And I'm wondering if you all could talk a little bit about if you plan to continue doing them or once this is over, you're going to say, thank God, never again, or sort of how you're going to carry this forward um, in the future once maybe there uh, aren't these same safety constraints. Well, I just wanted to say that um, when I started off saying that our projected sales for oh, yeah. 2020 were at about $82,000 a year, I'm at $290,000 a year. So we're going we're gonna to keep going. Uh-huh. Yeah. Nice job. That's a lot of work. We plan to continue our neighborhood farm share as well. Um, who knows what we'll be looking at in the next few months. So um, we'll be doing um, a lot of groundwork to make sure that our program is sound and at the same time, um, hopefully draw back some wholesale buyers. For API forward movement, um, we honestly are talking about sustainability all the time. <laughs> Um, and I think that uh, ideally what we would want to see is, you know, ongoing deepening of the relationship between the farmers and the community residents we work with. Um, because we are prioritizing systemically oppressed folks in the API communities for these particular boxes, um, that makes the funding of the boxes the big question. So we're continuing to seek out grant funding for that. Um, in the past, we had been working with uh, larger institutions like universities, as well as restaurants to try and offset the cost of subsidized CSA bags and, you know, we're continuing to look for more ideas. Um, one thing that I know that some of us on the team will be working on is building out some programming, um, a food sovereignty curriculum to share a little bit more about, you know, just skill building relationship with plants that honors the ancestral, ancestral lineage of the plant. 
Um, so that's going to be a piece uh, around deepening those relationships and looking into seed saving together um, with community residents. Um, we have a lot of other ideas, but we, um, we, yeah, we want food routes to continue. Thank you all. Let's see. Um, I'm wondering if any of y'all have considered doing sales by choice rather than just sort of a standard box letting people opt in and out. Um, and Oh, there you go. And if you have any concerns about like food waste or if you're getting feedback that people are using what they get regardless um, and how those two things are sort of in tension. Yeah, Alicia. Um, yeah, so because we're 20 farmers, we're always moving food away around in one way or another. Um, uh, I would say that, well, we operate with three sub hubs. So there's one, you know, both ends of town and then my farm is in the center of town. Um, we have our own farm stand and CSA. Um, our farm market is a pay what you please model. Um, and then what's left over at our own farm market on Wednesdays um, and what's left over um, through the bagging of the neighborhood farm share, we purchase and then through CARES Act funding, so through relief funding, we're able to move that produce out to um, folks who aren't able to push pr to produce though. So we work with um, neighborhood groups to get um, the additional produce out to the community. So we, we want to not, uh, we want to keep a box of produce, box of produce that we curate every single week. Um, but what we do have is an additional, like you can order salsas and chips and things like that. We also have different farms that are offering different products. So if you don't want to have a produce box, there's an ability to get, you know, greens and tomatoes and other things from other farmers um, a la carte. So there's definitely that option. Um, we don't, you know, and then we'll assemble it your order when it, when it gets there. So, um, uh, it, it's a, those to buy the items individually requires that the farmer has to package those things individually. And so the cost per unit is a little higher to buy, um, a la carte than it is. We buy it in bulk and then put it into a box. So, there's a slight premium for that, but if that's what folks want to do, they do. The other thing I wanted to add about our program is that we can take SNAP. Um, we're one of the few programs, I think, online uh, programs that can, can do that. Um, since our market already does double up food bucks um, and SNAP, um, we can run that. So there's an option on Shopify that, that basically suspends the order um, instead of paying with it with a credit card, you can suspend that order. And then when you pull up, we will run your, your bridge card on site and um, uh, take whatever double up and give you the double up that you have coming with your order. So we can do all of that on site at, at curbside. So we, um, we have a lot of folks that um, are food insecure in the city and it's a great way for them to stay safe and still use their, their SNAP and double up food box. I would also say about choice, um, you know, a lot of the customers we had this year were not seasonal produce shoppers. Sorry, That's not how they've... Are you to watch today? Oh, sorry. What was that? No. Oh. Um, so they're not used to the seasonal thing. So they were kind of getting tired of radishes and lettuce. And so there's a piece there that we learned about teaching our customers how to eat uh, seasonally. And I think we'll have to focus on that next year in order to keep our customers happy. Anybody want to unmute and ask a question? We have a couple more on the docket, but love to hear some new voices. I'll keep talking. I'm curious about what people have seen of the dynamic uh, of the shift towards uh, home delivery. We, we pivoted to doing the online ordering drive-through pickup and started our market three months early because our farmers lost all of their they lost their public market contracts, their 
farm to restaurant, farm to school, farm to corporate cafeteria contracts. So we, we the farmer's market said, okay, uh, let's try to help you move product. We don't know how to do it, but we're going to do it contactless, order ahead, pay online, prepackaged uh, bags. And it maxed out the program within two weeks. We ran it for three months. And then within two weeks that the, the regular farmer's market season started, we, we, we designed the market to have the drive through pickup, order, pre-order. And if you ordered with just one vendor, we'd let you also drive and buy things at other vendors and you can cut the line. The, the farmer would stop the pedestrian line and serve the, someone that pre-ordered because we know they're, they should get a priority. And uh, as soon as the walkthrough started, within two weeks, the drive-through went off the cliff, gone. And, uh, and the, the overall uh, you know, number of people is down. Um, and meanwhile, during that three month period, I was getting a notice, an advertisement every, every day to three days of a new uh, delivery service delivering from local farms into our city that I never heard of. And there were 60 new such services between March and June. And I did background checks on some of them and the farm didn't know who the delivery service was. The delivery service didn't spell the name of the farm right. They were claiming they're delivering local broccoli from New England in June, you know. So, so I'm wondering yeah, if your question else about the sort of, uh, the question of how like customer demand changed over time. The channels. Yeah. Is there an overall change to the home delivery? So we don't do any home delivery. We could never, Detroit is a um, hundred square miles, over a hundred square miles and it's too vast. We would, we would lose our shirts on home delivery. Um, people are accustomed to coming to the market and we just, we just continued those, um, those buying patterns of them coming down to the market. So we, we didn't go that route. There were other companies though, to your point, Kevin, um, there were startup businesses that did home delivery and um, they're not doing well right now. Um, you know, to do that yeah. last mile is, you know, expensive and um, uh, nobody's really doing it successfully in Southeast Michigan right now. Um, so we don't have any plans to do home delivery. We're gonna keep doing curbside pickup it's working for us right now. And, um, and, and to just to speak to your volume, yeah, we're at half of the volume that we were, you know, in peak pandemic, um, but it's enough. It's enough and our sales are enough that cost, that cost justify the, the staff and that we dedicate to it. And, um, and the farmers and the, and the vendors are happy because they have an additional sales channel on top of the being back at market. Um, we have just added to their sales. I'd say it's a fight every time, uh, like with the customer of the demand for door-to-door -door delivery. I mean, Amazon has just destroyed our um, patients with having to go pick stuff up. Um, and well, Amazon and other uh, businesses that you know have free delivery. So we just have to carve our space in the market and make sure that we're doing what is makes business sense and not just the opportunity to deliver. You know, we have to sort of for our organization, take a look back inside and say, do we really want to get into this? And the answer for me was a resounding no, and every my board agreed with me. So we tried to stick with customers that would work in this model. And there were enough of them, and we'll see if they're still around next year. You know, yeah, just have, like oh, we, we have worked for years to build relationships between farmers and with buyers. It's all about building relationships with these um, new members with Neighborhood Farm Share now. So we send out weekly emails and um, sometimes those emails aren't pretty. Um, you know, I get a lot of feedback if something is not grocery store perfect and I, I, I sucked it up many weeks and then finally I'm like, guys, I got to tell you why, why this corn is not grocery store perfect. Um, and that email was the, the one that I had the most feedback from um, people thanking me over and over for like, thank you for sharing how it is. I didn't know, or thank you for sharing it, sharing how it is. 
we need to say that more often. So people have really appreciated getting not only that firsthand um, touch and um, vegetables on their table, but also um, a little bit of education and community around that. Nade, how has your demand for the CSA boxes changed over time? Well, that's a great question. Um, the demand for CSA boxes for us mostly came from uh, existing uh, community residents who were connected to and also nonprofits and groups that were connected to. So it really was being generated um, kind of steadily based on folks recognizing that they needed a partner to provide produce and eggs. Um, and the number of folks that they were connected to was fairly steady. So it wasn't like we were doing um, a big push uh, promoting the bags to people who were buying them individually uh, or even in groups. So I think the situation is a little bit different from folks who are kind of car carving out a space in the market. I'm not sure if this answers your question. <laughs> no, it makes perfect sense. It's a, yeah. it's a very different type of relationship. Um, let's see. Um, we had some questions about the price point for boxes, um, and it looks like we had some answers in the chat, but what were the price points and how did you all set them? We've been using $25 um, box price for a number of years now. It just seems like a nice uh, number that people can um, accept. Um, and that was six to nine items, most often seven or eight items in the box. We're at, we're at $20 a box. Um, and it's, a, we're around that many items. It's sometimes it's too full to pack. Other times it's like, you know, it, when it's, you know, uh, when it was strawberry season, um, the boxes were a little lighter because strawberries cost more, but we really wanted to be able to offer that as well in our box. So, you know, depends on the seasonality of things and what, what we have, but, um, but that's our price point. I'm wondering if you reuse boxes we, we just started to, but not, um, every produce box will be, uh, that we sell will be a fresh box, but people have been giving us back boxes and then we pack value item, value added items into those boxes and use those to put for curbside. So we put the eggs and the chips and the yogurt and the meat and everything, we'll put that in that box and that's just an easier way to bring it out to their car. Yeah. All right, well, we are getting short on time. Um, so I just wanted to give our presenters a chance to share any last words or nuggets of wisdom or uh, pieces of advice for their peers here on the call. Uh, and then we'll wrap it up. Nuggets of wisdom, huh? <laughs> no pressure. Get out of the produce business. I'm, I'm totally just kidding. Um, there's actually been a huge interest from people wanting to get involved in the produce industry from the people who want to start a, you know, a brand new hydroponic farm or, you know, just farmers wanting to uh, increase their, their acreage and stuff. And I think we're in a real moment of growth and we need to seize that energy. Um, before COVID hit, CSAs were on the down slope in our region. We were worried about market attendance. We were worried about CSA um, being filled and that, changed overnight and it was incredible and so we really need to seize this moment as a food system as food systems people working as leaders um, to really make change yeah I, I'm I'll second what Katie said um, I think the I think that when uh, grocery stores ran out of product um, it really made it really made people afraid and um, and I think that there was an, a, a new, a newfound awareness of regional and local local food, and the importance of it um, really came to the forefront. Um, so, and and I saw that in my survey results of the the value that people have, um, and the recognition of um, the 
the need to support local food systems in, you know, now and, and always. So I do think that we are at a great, you know, food hubs in general are at a good inflection point um, and uh, that we can take forward. I, I would say too, I guess a word of wisdom, um, you know, there are a lot of different ways to do this. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, the, I think the, really the bulk of the cost from what I can see is in, you know, that last mile delivery. And if you can, can do more, you know, regionalized local pickups, like, you know, what Alicia and Katie did with working with neighborhood partners, what um, Nade did working at, you know, drop off spots, um, you can really get some good economies of scale there. And, uh, and, you know, keep it, and, and, I, and I also love that we have all been teaching folks about seasonality. Yeah, we have been too. Um, you know, people didn't know what to do with kohlrabi and now I'm sure are Googling like crazy. So it's, uh, it's been a great way to educate our consumers as well. Wonderful. Nada, any last words to share? Uh, I don't really have any wisdom to share. <laughs> I don't think that's <laughs> Echoing what folks are sharing, I know everybody has their their problem solving and wisdom that's being generated from your regions. So just inviting folks to trust that. And, um, you know, as always, what we're looking for here when we talk about systems equity is liberation and justice. So just looking for ways to connect our food-based work to the work that's happening on the ground for local community self-determination um, and being open to, you know, the discomfort and creativity that requires from all of us. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to all of you for joining us and to our presenters for telling their stories. Um, you know, we at, at the Food Systems Leadership Network and at Wallace Center are always so inspired and grateful to this community for being open and sharing what they've learned and connecting with each other. And we're just, you know, so humbled and honored to be able to provide this space for you all. As I said, this call will be recorded and sent out to y'all and put on our YouTube channel and on our website. So if you'd like to revisit it, feel free and thank you all again. And please take good care of yourselves and don't forget to register to vote. Bye.